Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, invites you to be the informed patient with the podcast that features experts from Central New York's only academic medical center. I'm your host, Amber Smith. Today, we'll learn from one of Upstate's scientists about the human cytomegalovirus. Dr. Gary Chan recently received a substantial federal grant for his work on this virus. Dr. Chan is an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at Upstate. Welcome to The Informed Patient, Dr. Chan. Hi, Amber. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. I'd like to start by having you tell us about human cytomegalovirus. Is it true that up to 80% of the population carries this virus? Yeah. What you can say is it's called a dormant virus or silent virus. Once we're infected, we have it for life. And... Well, 80% of us have it, just depending on different populations and where you live. But on average in the world, about 80% have it. Is it important to know whether you have it or not? Or if it's dormant, does it not cause any trouble? Well, for the most part, it doesn't cause much trouble. But it is important for you to know. It's important for if you ever need blood transfusions, transplants, and things like that. At that point, the virus, you could say, quote unquote, wakes up. It can cause a lot of problems. So how are people infected or how does the virus spread from person to person? It's really through infected fluids, bodily fluids. The major point of transmission is usually when you're adolescent. So when you're a little kid and you get infected, a lot of the times mothers kissing their kids, kids sharing food and all that, that's when most of it is spread. What does the virus do? I know you said it's dormant mostly in the body, but does it do anything while it's in there? Yes and no. For the most part, it stays pretty quiet. But every once in a while, if you're stressed, like any other herpes virus, many of you have heard of chicken pox before, there are stresses that can wake this virus up. And usually our immune system is pretty good at just stopping this virus from spreading too far. Do you know, is it one of the viruses that are tested in donor blood, like for the nation's blood supply? Do they test and look for this before they... Pass it to someone else? Yeah, absolutely. They screen for this virus now. And they have to know, especially for blood transfusions during transplants, things like that. They have to know whether you're CV positive. And people who don't have strong immune systems, this virus can cause a lot of disease. Which is why the NIH is very interested in this virus. And you got your grant from the National Institutes of Health, which I'm going to ask you about. But I'm still curious, CMV, cytomegalovirus, Does it produce any symptoms? Would a person know that they have it by symptoms? In general, when you first get infected, it doesn't cause much problems. It can sometimes lead to mononucleosis or mono. There's a couple of viruses that cause that. CMV is one of the viruses that can cause that. So if you're healthy, that's probably the most extreme you can get. But that said, with healthy individuals who have a full immune system, it has been associated with a lot of different cancers. And there are a lot of herpes viruses that actually can cause cancers. And CMV, I'm not going to say right now it's known whether it causes cancers, but it's definitely associated with a lot of different cancers. And it's an active field of research right now. How long has science known of this virus's existence? Probably since around the 50s. There's three scientists independently. I I think it was uh, Margaret Smith and Thomas Weller and W.P. Rowe. They all independently discovered this virus, got together, and known probably for about 70 years of the virus. We haven't really been able to study it much since until really the 80s when we actually had the tools to be able to study a virus. Is the potential connection to cancers a newer development? Yeah, there's other herpes viruses that they know do cause cancers. EBV or Epstein-Barr virus is one of those herpes viruses. CMV has a lot of the similar traits, and so they always thought that it could cause or lead to viruses. And so there's a lot of people who are actively studying it right now. And did you find a link? One of the big ones that everyone is studying right now is with glioblastomas. It's been associated with a lot of glioblastomas and breast cancers. Can CMV be treated? Yeah, there's a few antivirals that are out there. I won't get into the weed, but it targets a a protein. This antivirus target protein that's expressed by the virus that it needs to replicate. And uh, m- most of these antivirus will stop the replication of this virus. So it'll never get rid of the virus because the virus lies dormant inside of us. But 
once it activates, if you're a person who is immunocompromised, you can give these antivirals to prevent the virus from replicating. This is Upstate's The Informed Patient Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Smith. I'm talking with Dr. Gary Chan. He's an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at Upstate, where his lab focuses on studying the human cytomegalovirus. The National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases recently awarded you more than $3 million to put toward your research. Can you tell us about the work your lab is doing? The CMV causes a broad array of diseases. Lots of different organs can get affected. And so what my lab is really interested in is studying how this virus is able to spread around the body and how the virus hides from the immune system by laying dormant. And so half of my lab studies basic biology, try to understand how this virus is able to spread around the body, how it's able to cause disease, and what unique changes that it causes to cells and to the body so that we can target it. The other half of my lab then takes the information that we learn from one half of the lab, the basic biology, and then we try to develop antivirals to target some of those unique changes that the virus makes to the cell. So we're able to target and maybe eliminate some of the infected cells within the body and prevent spread and prevent disease. At this point, and I know it's early, but do you know, does this virus behave like another virus? There's a whole bunch of herpes viruses out there. Right. And it behaves similar to them. It, it has a lytic active infection where it's replicated. It has a silent stage. All herpes viruses do that. So it's very similar in that way. In terms of how it spreads around the body, it can be a little different. It uses a specific cell type. They're called monocytes. They're a type of white blood cell. And it uses them to basically piggyback off of monocytes to spread around the body. Some of the other herpes viruses target different types of cells, but the basic principle of it being awake and asleep is similar among all the herpes viruses. Are you planning or do you hope to come up with a more effective treatment for CMV through some of this research? Yeah, that's the ultimate goal uh, right now. Some of the problems with the current antivirus is they have a lot of severe side effects and they target really a protein that's expressed by the virus. And because of that, it can develop resistance to these antivirals. So my lab has taken a slightly different approach. We're trying to target cellular proteins. So proteins in the cell that the virus uses to replicate. And by targeting these cellular proteins, it's unlikely that these cellular proteins were able to mutate. And so if you target a cellular protein, you can prevent replication. It's unlikely that you'll develop resistance strains. And on top of that, what we try to do is try to identify proteins that are really only activated within an infected cell to limit the side effects. A lot of types of treatments, if you target just a general protein, it can lead to lost side effects if it's needed for just normal function. So we're trying to identify proteins that are only within a stress cell, like a virally infected cell. And so these treatments really would be aimed to help someone who's immune compromised. The general public doesn't necessarily need treatment day to day for this. Yeah, yeah, correct. But if someone suddenly developed kidney disease and was in need of a transplant, Mm -hmm. they would perhaps find themselves with a compromised immune system. And this would be very important, it sounds like. All transplants, you're screened for CMV. And if the donor or the recipient is CMV positive, you're automatically put on preemptive or prophylactic uh, antivirals to prevent replication of virus. So this will work in a very similar way. We can predict high-risk patients. And in those high-risk patients, we can give these antivirals early so that when the transplant happens, it prevents replication of the virus right from the beginning. Are you and the rest of the scientists in your lab concerned or worried about catching CMV through your work? There's always a little bit of risk involved, but the virus we generally work with are lab adapted. So they've been out of a human body for so long that it's unlikely that we can probably get affected by these strains of viruses. They've changed probably enough once we've pulled them out of the body and isolated them and you grow them in tissue culture. They lose a lot of these proteins that are needed to infect a human being. So, so for the most part, we're safe unless we take uh, clinical samples and that scenario, then there is a risk, but 
we are all pretty safe. We've tested all of us and everyone in our lab is CME positive. So we already have immunity against it. Can you talk about how humans can coexist in a world with potentially dangerous viruses like CMV, cytomegalovirus, and also SARS-CoV-2, which we're dealing with globally for three years and no. ongoing? How do we coexist? It's interesting. They're two very different viruses. With CMV, you would argue that we are coexisting because 80% of us have it. It doesn't cause a lot of disease. Uh, this virus was actually, honestly, was probably here before we were here. So the virus didn't learn to coexist with us. We evolved to coexist with this virus because it was already here. And we've learned to live with this virus for a very long time. And it really doesn't cause much disease or a lot of disease unless you're immunocompromised. With SARS-CoV-2, it was very different. It is learning to live with us, right? And so the virus came, right? We were here before it came and it caused a lot of disease. Over time, the virus will cause less disease and will eventually learn to live with that virus as well. But in the end, I think with a lot of these viruses, whether it's SARS-CoV-2 or whether it's CMV, which are really endemic at this point throughout the world, we're just going to have to learn to live with it and develop some antivirals and more take approach of protecting the vulnerable people versus trying to eliminate the virus, which I'm not sure that's possible at this point without the virus. I was going to ask that. Could you even, if you set out to eliminate CMB, that wouldn't really be possible, it doesn't sound like. Yeah, it would be really difficult because it's in most of us already. Maybe if you had developed a vaccine and you give it to all kids and over a long period of time, that would be a massive undertaking. And currently there is no vaccine for CMB. It's one of the largest human viruses out there. It's really complicated. And so develop a vaccine would be the first step. But even then, most people, especially in this state age, aren't going to just take a vaccine if they don't feel unwell. So it's more protecting the people who are vulnerable. This is the approach we need to take right now. And so your lab is doing that. If you're able to come up with a more effective treatment, it doesn't eliminate the virus, but it controls it. Correct. Right. And in the vulnerable population, particularly in transplant patients or any type of immunocompromised individual. Well, thank you so much for making time for this interview, Dr. Chan. No problem. Thank you for having me. My guest has been Upstate Microbiology and Immunology Associate Professor Dr. Gary Chan. The Informed Patient is a podcast covering health, science, and medicine brought to you by Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and produced by Jim Howe. Find our archive of previous episodes at upstate.edu slash inform. This is your host, Amber Smith, thanking you for listening.